tonight what we're really trying to focus on is how to get a lot of the people that are afraid of the confrontation, maybe they don't have any kind of backing, they're afraid to really talk to these people that, uh, that, that they're, they're coming from, they're used to going to church, these Christians are used to going to church and having conversations with their pastor on how to actually deal with, with atheism, a- atheists and a- atheism and agnostics. Um, unfortunately, there's not any kind of program to really do that on the opposite side. So what we're trying to do here tonight is trying to get everybody really up to speed, uh, so to speak. So you're not so apt, or, or, or you're not walking into unfamiliar territory. So what you have on your sheets, if everybody hopefully has a sheet, if you don't, we can get you one. Um, is those are just common questions that I get uh, from a lot of these, a lot of Christians. Now they come from different people, whether they be from the people that are on the fence, or the hardcore Christian, or even other people that are just not religious at all. So, um, going through that, uh, yeah, uh, there's a huge amount of questions that we can go through. Also, really good questions that we can ask. Ask them, because they're not used to getting asked questions. They don't get taught what kind of questions that we're going to ask whenever they go to church. So, that's part of another, uh, another thing that we're going to end up covering. Other things, common debating techniques. Um, how to actually talk to these people, um, whether they be rational, whether they be irrational. The point is, is kind of choose your battle with a lot of them. And uh, what I mean by that is, is it really worth it? Uh, for instance, if it's like a family member, a uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, um, if it's uh, somebody at work, so is it really worth it to have that kind of conversation and really try to combat them or just to get them to be quiet? So um, There's a lot of different things to kind of look at. One of the things that is a little bit different between how Christians uh, view uh, view the debate versus how atheists view the debate is they're trying a lot of times whenever I get the conversation it's about fear. What happens to you after you die? Um, well how can you be sure that what you believe is, is correct? Well those are fear based things. They're trying to scare you into some kind of salvation. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work with a lot of us because you know they're asking us to believe in something supernatural. The best thing I can really think of is how you guys came to be atheist, agnostic, secular people. Uh, a lot of us um, came about it by yourself. You know, you either just kind of got away from uh, standard religion. You kind of saw the problems with the ma- uh, with religion, and with that, uh, you just started educating yourself and just going out to Google and starting looking up things. Um, the other type of atheist agnostics are people that are born into it. Their parents were very secular, never pushed them to go to church. Uh, that's almost the way I came. My parents put me in Christian school whenever I was younger, uh, but they kind of quit. They didn't really see the whole point in it. Uh, but th- those are the main two types that we end up seeing, is educate, people that educate themselves, they got away from it themselves, they, those are uh, called apostates, and then you end up having the other side, which is people that are just born into it. So just, think, you just keep that in mind whenever you're dealing with people. All you really, really should do is just provide people with information. Um, give them things to look up. Tell them, please just go to the internet, try to research this. You know, this is your eternal life that you're talking about, and the rest of your actual known life. You know, what you have right now is, it, it is for a fact. You are living right now. What happens to you after you die? You don't actually know that. Other religions exist. Do they all have them wrong? Do you have them wrong? Do all of them have it wrong? That's that's kind of the starter for everything. Is just keeping that in mind. Um, some of the common questions, and this is, I have this laid out to where it's just kind of conversation based so you kind of know what rebuttals you can end up giving. Uh, they're, whenever they go to church and they're taught by the pastors, a lot of times they're given a spiel on you should ask them this, you should ask them this, and you should ask them this, and, and they'll bombard you with a lot of questions. They might ask two or three questions at the same time, and whenever they do that, what they're hoping to do is to, is to stump you. The beauty of that is you can pick and choose which one of those questions you can you can answer, which one you want to know, or whichever one you're good at, and uh, you know the most information on, and you can just answer that one and just be positive with it. Don't act scared. Don't do anything like that. Whenever you have all three, uh, whenever they're asking you all those, just say, hey, I can answer all three of those, or the most important one, whichever works which works best. But just come off confident. Just come off relaxed, don't push. They're used to violent atheists uh, atheists, because that's what they're told, that's what they see on Fox News, that's what they see all over the place. It's just those violent atheist people. So, uh, obviously, uh, starting off, and I tried to put this in order where uh, it's the most common that you would end up hearing. What if you're wrong? What if God exists? Um, This is commonly referred to as Pascal's wager. And uh, if you look on your sheet, it's 
it lays out, it's, it's basically two variables with four possible outcomes. Um, so, to explore those, God exists, God doesn't exist. You believe, or you don't believe. So what are those outcomes? Um, what they're trying to, to really come out with that whenever they're doing the Pascal's wager is to skip, once again, scare you back into believing. But it's really kind of BS. Um, to believe in God, to believe in Jesus, and in the biblical way, is to accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Well, you're not going to do that through fear. You're not going to say, well, I'm afraid of what happens to me after I die, so I better believe. Well, you don't think God would see through that and see that you actually don't believe, you never actually gave your heart and soul to it, you're still going to hell. So Pascal's wager, first and foremost, is, is that. Um, it's, it's just not a really good uh, way to really start that whole conversation, um, but they do it all the time. They're like, well, what if you're wrong? And, you know, you have to say, well, prove to me that your God exists. You know, it's, we're looking for facts, we're looking for things, and you've got to get, give them proof. So, you know, serving out of fear of lo uh, alone is just not a good way. It's, it doesn't make for good um, people of the religion. You know, they go door to door and they do this all the time, where they knock on your door and they say, well, what happens to you after you die? And they, they, they do this with their own time. You know, Mormons come around and they do it, and they want to make sure that you actually have it correct, and you know, it, it's a scare tactic. So that's first and foremost, don't really fall for that. It's just kind of, kind of weird. Um, the most important thing about the Pascal's Wager is, well, how do you know that, and what you can ask them is, how do you know that the God that you pray to is the right God? And uh, you get into the whole, like, why are you Christian? Why are you this, this way? Why are you Baptist? Why aren't you Catholic? Why are you this? And a lot of them are, it's just because they were born into that religion. They're only doing it because their parents did it, and it's the only thing that they know. It's the, uh, i trying to think of a good way to say that. It, it, it's just what they're following. And so it's easy to them, it's what, it's what they know. So by asking them hard questions that kind of go, well, why am I Christian? You know, to point out the fact that, yes, they are uh, one of the major religions of the world, does that mean that you have four billion, five billion people that are wrong? How do you know that the religion that you're, that you're praying to, the God that you're praying to, and the life that you're living is the one that God wants you to live? Is it okay to pr oppress gay people or, or to talk about slavery and you know, and and uh, uh, negative towards women? You know, like the way most common Christian books are written. Um, a lot of people are uh, completely unaware of that. You know, they they didn't haven't read the Bible. They just go to church. So they're trying to defend something that they don't know ex ex everything about. So that, that's uh, one of the things that typically stops a lot of them, um, and that's why I like it whenever they start off with the Pascal's Wager, is you get to do the whole counteract with, uh, why are you Christian? Mm -hmm. uh, what? Well, I'm obviously a Christian because, well, it, it's the right thing to be. Like, no, 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 no. Why are you Christian? And they're like, I, I don't know. What are you asking? Are you only Christian because of where you grew up? Are you only Christian because your parents are Christian? And it really kind of gets them thinking. And uh, a lot of times they will stumble on their answer because they've never been asked that question before. They might have, but typically you don't end up saying that a lot. Um, you know, uh, to let them know that there's uh, 30,000 different versions of Christianity. And all of them have their different interpretations of the Bible, whether it's literal, whether it's metaphorical, what, what books do they actually believe in and what stories are okay to believe in and what stories are bunk so um, just asking those is really fun uh, they also end up coming at you with well what happens to you after you die well you don't believe in a god what, what happens to you after you die <laughs> and that's where it gets it's really important to just stress I don't know no one's come back from the dead it's only been in literature because they'll say well Jesus came back from the de dead okay that's in book the, the book of the Bible is based on a true story. That's okay to say. Um, just like Titanic, the movie Titanic was based on a true story. Um, you can start with the smallest little thing and you can say based on a true story. So that inst whenever I've said that to them, they've uh, typically gone, oh. And then they kind of get this question mark on their face that they're surprised that you're saying that, but it's true. Uh, you can go back in history and, and just to kind of give you a, a background on it, uh, with the Romans, they actually around that time, approximately that time, there was a guy that went around claiming to be Christ. Now, Christ just means uh, Savior, man who claims to be uh, the Son of God. So, they claimed to have executed somebody that was 
going by the name Christ. Not Yeshua or Jesus or any of that, just Christ. Um, and just like if you, if you were, write, were to write a novel and you wanted to base it on a true story, you can take any little facts you want and put together a whole story. Just that story's kind of evolved. Um, so whenever people ask, uh, what happens to you after you die, it's really important to talk about, um, well, nobody knows. Nobody's come back from the dead. Uh, you don't know. You just hope. And what facts do you have? Uh, what happens to you after you die? They say, what happens to you after you die? They say, well, I know for a fact I'm going to rot in the ground. Mm -hmm. They're like, what happens to your soul? Personally, I don't believe in the soul. There's no evidence for it. There's nothing that's there. That's, that's my personal preference, uh, personal standpoint. And, uh, but it kind of goes along the same lines. There's no proof. There's no evidence for anything that happens to you after you die. Um, there's been studies that have been conducted that say, oh, well, you lose a certain amount of weight after you die, and that must be the weight of the soul. Inconclusive. Um, the, 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 the evidence that a lot of these people get, and I'll use an example, the evidence that a lot of these people get comes from Christian sources. Uh, you probably hear about once a year they say, we found Noah's Ark. Every single year it seems to happen. Who does it come from? Christian archaeologists. People that are on, on a, a pilgrimage to try to find facts. Well, that's the problem with the Bible, is that they have all the answers in this little book. They just don't have any of the questions. So what they're trying to do this whole time is to say, well, this story was correct. It's in the Bible. Here it is. And you're like, well, that's great. That's one story. What about the rest? You know, um, Just because one story in the Bible is correct doesn't make it all correct. And you can just always build upon that whenever you're talking to people. So yeah, no one knows for sure exactly what happens to you after you die. Um, so to believe in something supernatural, it, 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 it's an extraordinary claim. It requires extraordinary evidence. Just, uh, that's always just been a really fun one whenever they bring that up. It, it, they have such hope in their eyes and they're like, yeah, what happens to you after you die? That's, that's a little canned response that they're used to giving because that's what they're told. So.